Welcome, Miracle Makers. We are in season five, and this season is angels, saints, and channels. And oh my gosh, I'm so excited to bring to you the amazing Jack Purcell today. We are going to start by setting our intentions. We are then going to go into talking to Jack and Jack channels is an incredible channel i had the pleasure of witnessing and lazarus and lazarus will come through at the second half before we begin as always we set the intentions and miracle makers our mission is to make the world work for a hundred percent of humanity in the shortest time possible through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone as first said by um, Buck Minister Fuller. I cannot thank you enough for being here and we're gonna set the intention. Uh, we are so grateful for the being that you are. We're so grateful to have Jack, to have Lazarus, to have everyone here. We're so grateful for Tony Camacho and Ginger and Daniel and and Dr. Bonnie that led us this miracle maker community to Jack. We're so grateful for every word that comes through and as you're listening and as you're feeling the subtle energy of today, know that you are keeping every divine appointment. This is a divine appointment, Jack, uh, and Lazarus, and you, and all of us, divine beings. If your eyes were closed, go ahead and open them if your eyes are. And Jack, welcome. Is there anything else that you want to add to the intent of today's show? I think you did that beautifully. Thank you. You're so welcome. Jack, um, there's so much I want to know about you and so much I want the world to know about you. We're in season five and we're recording this and this will be released a little bit later. What are you most excited about these days? What is joy? What is just getting you out of bed and full of energy? Oh, well, I... There's so many things in, in happening for me right now. Part of what's most exciting for me is I'm finding new direction for what I want to do. I've been uh, channeling for, oh, 48 years, I guess it is now. I, I sometimes lose count. And that has been the major thrust of, of my work. But behind it uh, has been um, my own exploration, uh, my own... I call it a joy, the joy of thinking. And, and uh, I, I, it's hard to say because a lot of people don't really understand that in terms of what's your hobby. You know, I have a hobby of thinking. You know? <laughs> I love to, at late night, go sit outside and, and, uh, you know, and just think about ideas and think about things. And of course, I've been listening to recordings of Lazarus for, for so many years. Uh, and and I think about uh, uh, so much of that information that that he talks about. I listen and I think and I go go back and re-listen and 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 you know ponder it. And I love doing that. Uh, and and now, uh, in fact, I'm having more time to do that because there are no more physical workshops in that sense. Um, no more traveling uh, for a workshop for me. And, and this sort of thing, I'm going to have more time to actually listen to some of the recordings that I had to, I could only listen to briefly because, hey, I, I'm, you know, I just got back from San Francisco. Now I got to turn around <laughs> and head off to Los Angeles or head off to somewhere on the East Coast. And so, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, that that workshop happened. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And, and sometimes I didn't. So it's going to be fun for me to be able to go back and, and re-listen to some of the recordings that I, in fact, missed because I was so busy traveling around, so busy channeling. And, and then, so that's part of what's exciting me. The other part of what's exciting me is, you know, is 
to open a, my, my relationship with my soul has been uh, always there. I mean, I've been very aware of the presence of my soul and it keeps calling me uh, to do certain things. Writing is one of those things that it keeps calling me to. And, and you know, I say and, and describe it to friends as I've been battling with my soul in terms of it saying yes, yes, yes. And I'm saying, no, <laughs> not, no, I can't. No, I don't have anything valuable to say. I don't, and, and, and I read, you know, I read other people's writings and it's like, oh, <laughs> oh, there's, they're so beautiful, so incredible that it's like, wow, you know, uh, nobody needs to hear what I have to write, but my soul keeps saying yes. And, and I've come to realize that what I'm looking for is, yeah, I wanna write, uh, I wanna write, uh, to people's souls, but to communicate, not communicate with them, not, but to write to them, to sort of acknowledge their presence is maybe what I want to do. It's not like I want to have a dialogue with someone's soul. I, I want to be able to, you know, touch someone's soul through what I write. And I want to, I want to write about, for example, the people that I encounter. You know, I live part of the year in, in Colombia, and, and the people here are uh, amazing people, the energy, the vitality, and, and the range of people from, you know, abject poverty to, you know, incredible, beautiful, spiritual uh, beings to uh, extreme wealth. Uh, the whole range is available here of, of types of people. And, and, what, and the land itself is so, such a combination of, of you know, ugly, and beauty, the ugliness and the beauty of the land is so amazingly present. And, and you know, and there's, as I say, there's a, there's a war, I've talked about, there's a war between the, the, the violence and the beauty between the ugly and the beautiful. And beauty always wins, beauty always wins. And, and it's, you know, it's here that I, I, I sense the soul of the land, the soul of the people, and, and I want to write about that, to share that, so that other people can maybe get a, a glimpse of that, a feel of that. And therefore, my soul's calling me to write. And I want to write in, in that sort of what I call mystical way, uh, to, to write about soul that I experience in myself and other people, in the land, in the places that I, that I go to. And therefore, I want to travel more. I mean, I love traveling and I've traveled a lot with work. Now I want to travel a lot as me. And just to, to for example, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up going to Scotland for work, the final workshop that's happening. But following that, <clears throat> there's going to be five days in the Hebrides of Scotland in, in Isle of Skye and Isle of, of Lewis. And from there, I'm heading off to Florence to spend five days or uh, five nights in Florence just by myself, and as I, as I've described it, you know, people, what are we, what are you going to do in Florence? Well, there's a lot to do, but what I'm planning to do is, uh, more metaphorically, I suppose I suspect is one day I'm going to walk this way and, and see what I discover, and the next day I'm going to walk that way and see what I discover, and the third day it's this way, and the last day I'm going to go that way. I have no plans other than to just walk and experience whatever I discover. And maybe there'll be something to write about. Maybe there won't be. Maybe there will just be a time to think about what I think. So what I'm excited about is battling with my soul, because I know my soul <laughs> is going to win, uh, traveling to explore and discover more of myself out there in the world, writing and, and exploring what that, that is. It's a risky business a risky experience and spending time thinking. And, and one other thing that's there for me that I'm, I'm really excited about that I'm gonna have time to do now. I've always had this, this fantasy and that, uh, of, of getting together with people, a, a small group, four or five people maybe. And you know, getting together for an evening of dinner but mostly getting together to talk, to just share ideas and talk about, and, and to work magic, in, in fact. Um, you know, there's magic in the telling and, and to just sit and talk about 
what's going on in my world? What's going on in your world? What's going on in yours? And I love what do I think of that? And what do I think of this? And you know, just to share an evening like that, a small, intimate, quote, dinner party uh, with, <laughs> with friends. That, that, with that, that, those things that excite me. That is so <laughs> exciting. It's so exciting to have Florence on the forefront and to have all that you're working on these days with coming into being yourself, listening to what you've channeled already through Lazarus, what has uh, what you've created this incredible body of work and so um for people that are joining us and for people that are going to be watching this we are with jack jack channels lazarus jack started in 1974 and started <laughs> with a journey as was in insurance and in the corporate world and had a wife named Penny. Um, I know a little bit about you and a little bit about your earlier life. Um, if you could summarize quickly what your childhood was like, how did you meet Penny, trans channel, you know, trans meditation, bringing this in, just a quick summary of that. Quick summary. Well, my uh, childhood uh, was a childhood of, 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 I say normal, but but we moved a lot. You know, I was born in Wisconsin, and and uh, we moved from Wisconsin to Ohio to uh, to to Michigan, and uh, you know, and a lot of places along the way. My father was a traveling salesman, so we ended up. You know, I spent first and second grade in one town, second, third and fourth grade in another, fifth and sixth in another. Just you know, moving and moving and moving, which, you know, gave me a sense of, of uh, as I look back, a sense of fluidity. It gave me a sense of being non-judgmental because I didn't, you know, this is my home and where I belong and these are my people. No, these are my, my home and where I belong for two years. No, I, I belong someplace else, someplace else, someplace else, different people, different backgrounds, different, different, towns and things like this you know religion for example you know we went to whatever church was nearby a protestant grew up as a protestant but you know this is a pretty church let's go there oh here's this is an easy church to get to let's do this one you know it wasn't like we're we're, we're catholic or, or or lutheran or episcopal or you know methodist or presbyterian we we did them all and so i had i realized that growing up I had this kind of fluidity of, of not owning anything that's mine, but exploring everything that's there, making new friends all the time and, and new teachers, new ways of doing things. I met Penny when I was uh, 14, moved to a brand new town, <clears throat> showed up in school a day late. The uh, first day had begun. I was just the second day. Earth science class was the first class I had. And, and the teacher said, says anybody, seeing the Rocky Mountains and, and this girl in the front row, I was sitting way in the back, this raised her hand and, and he said, the teacher said, well, what did you think of them? And she said, oh, they're very nice. And I thought, what in the world, boy, if I saw the Rocky Mountains, I'd have a whole lot more to say about how wonderful they are. And so I wondered who that was. And that's how we met. And, and after meeting, discovered we just hit it off. And uh, we were married when we were 20. We both went, to, we finished high school. Uh, she in one school, I had moved, <laughs> to, finished in another school. She went to one university, I went to another. We joined up in our sophomore year and uh, you know, completed college, got married. We're planning to go to law school. That didn't happen. Um, so I got a job in, in, in an insurance company and, and ultimately working in uh, human relations in the insurance company. and. Uh, Decided Michigan. Oh, want to get out of Michigan? It's too cold, too much wind, tired of winter. <laughs> Moved to Florida, got a transfer to Florida, and that's when uh, you know all all this this happened. And it was nothing planned. It just it just happened. And uh, we had taken a course in in meditation, and and Scott Penny had taken the course. I wasn't going to do that, but she dragged her husband along. And uh, oh, okay, I'll I'll do the weekend for it with you, and and that opened the door, and uh, and then uh, you know time moved fast. Couple of years by, and Lazarus came through, and 
it was a shock to me and and uh it took me a while to to accept what was going on i had to let other people experience him people that i didn't knew well enough to trust but not well enough to know their background you know in terms of uh, they weren't too close but I, I knew that trusted them and and finally it I came to understand the love that was there. It wasn't, yeah, you know, I listened to the information first, but yeah, you know, information's information. And I was listening one night and all of a sudden I was just overwhelmed with the incredible love that, that is there. And I realized that's not me. I mean, I love, but not like that. And that's when it set in at two in the morning, okay. Uh, this is this is what's real and this is what's happening to me and so get out of the way get out of the way and let it happen and uh so that kind of my what my life was just kind of really getting out of the way and letting it happen uh from move to move to move from one town to another as a child and uh you know uh, and then growing up you know loving people and you know get out of the way and let it happen and, Get and out of the way and let it happen. Wow, um, your traveling salesman's son. <laughs> yeah, right. Son right. of a traveling salesman. <laughs> son of a traveling salesman and um, met your beloved Penny at age 14. And um, I didn't, I knew a little bit of the stories of Penny through my friend, Tony Camacho. Tony Camacho is no longer in physical form and um, right prior to his leaving physical form, he was in this in-between state. He had the near-death experience, which he'd always dreamed about. And um, during the course of the past few months, he's been sending me messages about you. And then um, uh, uh, Dr. Bonnie in, said, oh, mention that you were coming to town. And I thought there is no way that I could clear my schedule and that you might have space. And somehow the two, I call them divine appointments occurred. And if I could go to Scotland and be uh, clear my schedule and be there, I would totally be there and experience the enrichment that comes with being in the presence of you, Jack, and Lazarus as well. Just um, for me, the story that I heard is at some point there was Penny and there was another partner and the, uh, the three of you, and I thought my mind was blown because in the 1970s or early 80s for someone to be channeling, for someone to say, hey, there is more than one way to love. There's more than one way to create family. There's more than one. Well, we have more than enough. You can never love less. You will always love more. Can you just share a little bit about um, the relationship with Penny, uh, adding more love to your relationship, but, and what that's been like. Well, yes, as a, well, yeah, Penny and I met when we were 14, um, and spent the first two years, uh, high school years, ninth, 10th grade, same school, then I moved, spent the next two years separately. She went off to college, I went off to college, uh, but we joined up again. She transferred. I went to the University of Michigan. She uh, went to uh, a school, private school north of Chicago, and then joined up. And, and we were at, at a particular uh, college event. It was a homecoming dance. And uh, I mean, <laughs> homecoming. We weren't coming home. We just, hey, let's go. And I, I was sitting there, and I looked at her, and I realized this is someone I want in my life. And I knew then, okay, we we're going to get married. And you know, the, the love we shared was uh, it's soulmate love for sure. Um, we were married. We were married for ten years, and during that time, Lazarus did come through, and and we began. I left the the insurance company because the schedule was such that I had to choose: either I do this or I stay there because I was quote climbing the corporate ladder. <laughs> and it was either do that or do this. And it's like, okay, do this. And, and it was a rough, rough go for a while. 
And, and part of what was, as I said, I talked to people I knew well enough to trust, but not well enough to know their history, their background. You know, Michael was one of those people. He was steeped in TM and, and steeped in a, a true broad range of Eastern philosophy and metaphysics. And, and we knew of him and, and we became friends. Uh, Penny and, and Michael became friends. And so it was, hey, Michael, we would like you to talk to Lazarus. We'd like you to have an experience, give us your feedback in a sense. And so, you know, that's how we developed a friendship. In that, he became a dear friend and, and we wanted him to come work with us. And during that time, it became apparent that the two of them were falling in love. My love for Penny, I am, I'm, uh, at that time, I wasn't fully owning, I wasn't owning that I was a gay man, but I was. And, and we had a very loving relationship, but it, 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 and it was sexual, uh, but not, it was becoming less so. And it became much more of a, a soulmate, much more, more like brother, sister, uh, but an incredible love that we shared. And the thing is, for me, I saw, look, she is happy falling in love with this guy who can be the husband that I really don't want to be. You know? And so it's like, let me get out of the way of this. And it was actually, you know, Lazar spent hours with them dealing with their levels of guilt, dealing with their levels of emotion. You know, he would spend, uh, I'd go into trance for like three or four hours at a time as they would deal with this stuff. And, and, and for me, it was like, how could I not? How could I say no when she's so very happy and, and they're so very happy? It's making me very happy to see them, them, them in this, this loving position. And, and so, you know, it, it, she came one day and said, you know, we're married, but, you know, and, and, but Michael and I'd like to get married. So how about we get a divorce? And so, yeah, I'll be glad to. And I went to Haiti because in, in Haiti at the time, <laughs> you, you could get a, a divorce in 24 hours. And, and I'd never been out of the country so late. You know, go to <laughs> Haiti for a week and enjoy yourself and, you know, and get the divorce, which took me you out know, just real quick and, and call me up. Oh, yeah. Well, OK, we're now divorced. OK. <laughs> and they got married. And, and the three of us, you know, it wasn't a menage a trois at all. It was, they had their loving relationship. Michael was a dear and loved friend. And Penny and I had our relationship. And, and the three of us had, had the, the, the relationship as well. So it was a, a complex situation, but, uh, you know, it, it, it worked beautifully. And we worked magic together. And, you know, there's, there's I mean, Lazar talks about, you know, there's, there's beauty magic and there's love magic. And I mean, there's all kinds of magic, but he has a strong emphasis on, on beauty magic and love magic. And, and what that comes down to in a simple sense is when you're gonna sit down to work magic, to change the reality, rather than just piling into it and, and wherever you happen to be, stop and let yourself get in touch with and in the resonance of love and just totally feel that love, not just, mm, but really get in the depth of it, the resonance of it, so that you become a part of that resonance, so that you are, you know, just this being of, this beam of love, and in that position, now work the magic that you want, now state what you desire, what you want to create with harm to none, and visualize from that place, rather than from a place of, you know, I'm scared and, and I'm angry or, you know, my reality is all screwed up. And so I have to work magic to make it better. No, okay, that's where you're at, but don't stay there. Get into a place of this, as much love as you can feel. It may be not the best, but get where you can, as much love. And from that place, change your reality rather than from the place of feeling desperate or afraid or, or worried. And, and so, you know, it's like love's magic. And that's something that for me has, has something that, that I always work. I mean, that's what I do. And, you know, I loved Penny. I mean, I grew up, I loved my mother. And I, I, <laughs> I, I was there for her. Then I loved Penny. I was there for her. 
And I love Penny and Michael, the couple the, the, that they were, and, and worked a lot of magic in that regard. And then when they left, you know, I realized, well, you know, what I do is I love someone. That's what I've done for 40 years of my life with Penny. We, we were together for 40 years. And, and you know, I love, I love someone. And so I decided, well, I want to keep doing that. Uh, only this time, because I want to own my own sexuality. And, and because it's, I mean, being gay is much more than sexuality. It, it's a whole beingness, uh, a, a presence of soul. And, and, and you know, uh, so I wanted to be the gay man that I am. And, and I want to love someone. And so I, I went about working that magic from that place of love, not from a place I'm desperate to find somebody, but from the place of being totally in this space of being a loving being. And now I open up to, to find a man to have a loving relationship with. And I, I do. And we've been together now 21 years. 20, 20 years. 20 <laughs> years. Wow. Yeah. 20 yeah. years. And this going back and forth for Columbia started for him to with his family. He's Colombian. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Well, he was born in Colombia, raised for, for a lot of years in the States and then back and back to Colombia. Uh, basically, yeah, he was his first language is English, thank goodness. <laughs> but he's, yeah, he grew up most of his lifetime in Colombia and most of his family is here in Colombia. And so he wanted me to come before he could, because he getting his green card and all that, uh, wanted me to come to meet his family which I did, and they embraced me like, uh, of course. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a strange situation because, you know, Colombians are a very Catholic uh, country and, and in the Catholic church, being gay is an abomination, but, you know, uh, but family supersedes church. And so, <laughs> like, yeah, okay, those, those people may be abominations, but you're my family. <laughs> I don't care what the church says. You know, I don't care what that old man in Rome said, you know, or in the Vatican said, you're my family. And, and also, uh, there's an interesting thing that, you know, it, that there's much more of a connection with the feminine energy than with the masculine energy within the Catholic Church, at least what I have found in Latin America, I think probably in all over. And therefore, although they reference the goddess as Mary, there's much more a sense of the goddess. And they'll say, we're not going to listen to that old man in the Vatican, but we will pay attention to what the goddess has to say. And the goddess is about love and therefore loving family. But I fell in love with Colombia as well. So that was when we, he finally could come and we did come to visit. I was the one that said, why don't we live here for a while? Why don't we, why don't we get a, own a, some property and live here for a while? I that love it here. So fantastic. Jack is coming to us from Columbia. This is Dr. <laughs> Sarah Larson. You're watching season five of Miracle Makers. And this season is all about angels and saints and channels. And Jack has been sharing with us what lights him up. Jack is going to, oh my gosh, he's getting ready to spend time just being Jack, which we take for granted so often and reconnecting his soul with all of the beauty. There's that aspect Jack just shared earlier in this, that there is the energy of the dark, the, um, the not yet beautiful, and then there is the beautiful. And at, ultimately, those two elements wind up being in chaos and contrast to one another until beauty is seen throughout. And so Jack is also going to one of my favorite places that I lead retreats to and take people to Italy, to Florence, and to walk the streets and explore the world and connect directly with the soul of beauty, where the Roman gods walked and the um, aqueducts were built and where law took on multiple forms. We're still practicing much of that law. I can't wait to read Jack's book that he's going to spend time writing, <laughs> which okay. is so, so amazing. Just feeling into that. What a gift. 
What a gift to be brave enough, courageous enough to bring this voice, this channel forward. And so some of these questions I'm going to ask Lazarus as well. I, I, I would love your perspective, especially I grew up every faith as well. I had near death experiences. And when I mean every faith, we I was born in Pakistan and in that region, three major religions, Christianity, Hinduism and Islam. And much of my early schooling was in the Catholic Church. My parents are Islamic in origin and my grandparents and everybody so worked with Gandhi and the principles of Hinduism. So it was always in our home, all of that, along with Hollywood. We had one of the first televisions, cloth would come off the television and all the neighborhood kids, we'd sit on the floor and the parents behind us and Bob Hope at the pyramids or Elvis Presley doing his little dance or <laughs> we had the projector that would play the movies that we would get from the state. My uncle was a doctor in the US and would send fantastic things back for us to enjoy until he himself came. And of course that was the draw for us to come, for my family to come. And um, I've heard this in a, the beautiful movie, movie Concussion, where a doctor from Africa says, you know, in the other worlds, other than the United States, heaven is here and the United States is right here. And so this is coming to the U.S. was a dream come true. My mom, my dad got to educate their girls and boys just as equally and share all of the bounty of what the American dream is. And so, Jack, uh, I was in your recent workshop and you really, Lazarus, when he was channeling, shared America is still the land um, a chosen land. And so a, a series of questions I'm going to ask both of you. Jack, how do you feel about America, United States in particular? The Americas well, and United yeah, States right. in particular. Americas, yes. <laughs> well, of course, you know, growing up, I was very, what, you know, the United States, that's it. You know, that's the world. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, that got freed up somewhat in terms of, as I say, moving around so much, didn't get locked into the one particular place. So I was open to philosophies and ideas other than my own. And, and uh, but I absolutely, you know, I feel that America, that the center of this vortex of spirituality, there's several of them around the world, obviously in the Far East, in the Middle East, and, and, and in the West, there's definitely, I feel, in the United States. And, and there is also, you know, there's also a center in South America that I hadn't figured out or discovered until actually I was in college when I was taking, you know, uh, Spanish classes. And, and we spent most of our time not talking Spanish, but reading philosophers. And it's like, wow, you know, these these aren't Northern European white men you know, the, that, are, that have these ideas. You know, Northern European white men aren't the only smart ones in the world. You know, it's like from my childhood, that's what I was taught, you know, in terms of in school and to discover, by golly, there are, you know, people of, of color that are very smart, you know, Latin American people. And there are people of, you know, and there are women who are also ought to be listened to you know, a lot. So, yeah, the, the, it was, but in all that awakening, I feel that that was a time, and I think it still is, that there's a, a vortex of spirituality opened up in America that hadn't been there before. Uh, some people want to say it moved from, I don't think it moved out of the, I think it opened up. And, and I think that there, you know, it's like a progression in our linear reality. It's always been there, but now the world was ready for uh, that opening. And I think that, yeah, America is the, the, the boiling pot, the cauldron of hope in the world. And I think it still is. And I am saddened 
by how there are those who want to ex extinguish that hope and, and who want to uh, put that, not, it's not a fire, it's, 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 it's the brewing of, it's the, it's the light of hope. And, and it saddens me that there are people who, are, who seem to want to put that out or who are, are threatening to do so in whatever way. But I don't think it's gonna happen. I don't think that's going to be the case. I know I, I you know, there's, Lazarus has points out, it's not an original quote from him, but it's, it's associated with him so much that, you know, goodness and truth will prevail and beauty is eternal. And in, in reality, goodness and truth always do prevail. And it's, oh, how horrible the world is. What about World War I, World War II? What about the, you know, the Holocaust? What about, yes, all of that is horrible. But yet goodness and truth do prevail, not as fast as we would like, but it does prevail. And goodness and truth prevail and good and beauty is eternal. And I, I, and, and I, you know, America is a cauldron of hope for the world with, you know, the freedom, the free will, the, the, the constitution that is an imperfect document, uh, but, you know, has the breathing room to both inhale and exhale, to wax and wane, to be that fluidity of the, of the change. And, and, you know, it's an amazing document that no other country has, no other country. I mean, a lot of our countries have documents of freedom and this sort of thing, but none are as fluid and as alive as the American constitution. And, and so, you know, yeah, I, I am happy to say I'm an American, I'm, I'm happy to say that I explore the world and I welcome the rest of the world and look forward to living in South America and looking would love to live in, in Spain or Portugal or Italy, any of those places, you know, in terms of, I'm even thinking about maybe doing that some, someday, <laughs> you know, but it's, yeah, to have this as my home, uh, I feel incredibly blessed. I guess that's the word I want to say. I feel incredibly blessed that I was born here, that I cre I'm creating the reality where I was born here. And that I really think, you know, it's wonderful that so many people who weren't come here because that's what, that's what, that's what makes the cauldron bubble. You know, it, that's what it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not like a fire underneath the cauldron. It's, it's something mystical that causes this cauldron of hope to, to keep, keep putting out hope. And I think what that is, it's the diversity of, of, of people from all over the world, from people from the richest to the poorest, from the most educated to the least educated, all coming together, contributing something of themselves. Because it's like, you know, I have you know, what my knowledge and things like that and my ideas I can contribute, but I learn so much from, for example, the people who uh, you know in in Colombia who have no education at all or other than you know, a minor education. They can talk the language, they can't write it. You know, they they lived in such a remote areas that they they can't really write the language, but they can talk it. But they have ideas and a way of expressing ideas that go, oh my. God, <laughs> whoa, what insight that is. And wow, that causes me to rethink some of the things that I would just somehow automatically hold on to. So it's like, it's this mixture of, of, of educated, uneducated, uh, experienced, inexperienced, uh, you know, young and old uh, that all come together that I think is the alchemy that that causes what America is to be, and and so you know I, I'm I'm glad that I'm a part of it, and I welcome others to join in and to be a part of it. Yeah. What I love about your answer is really speaking to the forefathers. The forefathers were alchemists. They took yeah. uh, what never existed 
ideas, some of them highly educated, some of them um, practically uh, um, just in the form of self-educated with ideas. Uh, and they brought forward this notion first ever that there could be a peaceful transfer of power. And uh, in all the lands prior to then, it hadn't been written this peaceful a process transfer of power that had been remembered by everyone and shared and laws. And I love that you were going to be a lawyer, you and Penny, and um, oh, how wonderful, because to know that there is an understanding that the agreements that you make and write on paper are truly what transforms all of society. And we're witnessing that from Canada all the way to the tips of the bottom of South America to Brazil, this, this one unit on this land. And I love that you're exploring other places and bringing forward uh, these amazing understanding of what you just shared Wisdom isn't just intellect. Wisdom is simple and wisdom is ideas that transform and wisdom is subtle energy that's exchanged between peoples as they're communicating different ideas. Thank you, Jack. That's so <laughs> profound. <laughs> oh. um, what, so in a moment or two, we're gonna transfer over and have you become um, the channel Prior to that, I have three questions that I'm going to ask Lazarus as well. What is an angel, right? What is an angel to you? How would Jack define an angel? Wow, I hadn't really thought about that because, I, you know, anyway, for me, how would I think of an angel? I think of an angel as a being beyond the physical, who is, who is outside, who is, who is outside the set of being human. I think it's, it's, I think it is a spark of the divine. We are a spark of the divine. It's a different spark. There are all kinds of sparks of the divine. We're sparks that chose to become physical. And I think angels are sparks of the divine that are guides to our soul. That's what I think they are. Beautiful, guides to our soul. How would you, Jack, define a saint? A saint. And wow. I love that you're going to Florence where the land of angels, everywhere you go, the churches oh, and everything. I, 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 oh my gosh. Um, and then also a place where in Italy, saints are canonized and um, brought forward. Uh, yeah, uh, um, that's far, but for me, you know, I mean, okay, the Catholic church says, okay, so-and-so is a, a saint. And we're going to spend 30 years figuring out if this person's a saint. To me, I think it's, it's, it's I don't have such rigid standards. <laughs> it, it, is, it can be a physical being alive in body as they are, is someone who lives their life honoring themselves, but honoring others more. So I don't think it's someone who is a martyr who you know, only cares about other people and not about themselves. I think it's someone who cares about themselves, honors themselves, but honors other people more, cares about themselves, loves themselves, but loves others more and cares for others more and will live that, not just say it, but live that. I think that's a saint. You know, and I think some of the some of the saints that are sainted, and I don't know who they all are, but you know, I mean, I think of Mother Teresa is a saint, you know, and 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 uh, so yeah, whether or not the church says so, you know, <laughs> she cared for herself, but cared for people other than herself more. And there are people, you know, there are some people in my life who I think they are saints, not by the church definition, but 
by my definition in that I am inspired by how beautifully they take care of themselves and love themselves and how much how the love and caring for others is even more beautiful. And love that's and that's caring just... for others um, and the, defined within a religious body or outside of a religious right. body. Right. It's a person, an angel or a saint outside of, it can be recognized without a religious body saying, this right. is an angel, this right. is a saint. Jack, thank you for that. And this last one, what is a channel? How do you define channel as you would? Okay, for me, into... that's very, very <laughs> easy. It's something I do when I, when I do, it's, for me, channeling is getting out of the way. It's getting out of the way. Because, you know, I mean, there's this being that wants to just talk through, talk through me, use my vocal cords, wants to use my, you know, body to, to not to be in it, but to channel through it. So it's not like Lazarus is here. It's he's channeling through me. And it's what's my job? My job is getting out of the way. And I do that for every workshop I, I, that I have done. And there are hundreds of them over the last 40 some years, uh, almost 50. I take a couple of days ahead of, of a workshop just to be alone in solitude. Solitude is my sacred place. And I work on, okay, but I work with my child. I work with my adolescent. I work with my ego. I work with the uh, lesser parts of me and with the more parts of me. And I work with my higher self and my soul. I mean, I got this team that I work with and my goal is okay. I need to get out of the way. I need to be out of the way. And in those days that I'm alone, I also watch television and catch up on emails and do this sort of thing. But I always take the time to consciously work with all those components to get out of the way so that when I go downstairs and Lazarus is gonna come through me, I'm out of the way. And I do that partly because that's what people listening deserve. But, and I, I don't, it's hard to say more, but I think it's more personal. I do that because that's what Lazarus deserves. That's what Lazarus deserves. He's there to communicate. He deserves me being out of the way, you know, and I just a real quick antidote early on when they first started, I first started channeling, you know, there was a time there, oh yeah, marijuana, you know, and smoking and, and, you know, getting high. And one night, you know, with friends, we were getting, you know, having a little party, getting high. Someone called, needed to talk to Lazarus, someone, a dear friend. And so, okay, oh my gosh, I'm, no, I'm a bit stoned, a lie. <laughs> So I went into trance anyway, and, and apparently all things went well. And when I came out, I was like, not at all any, uh, not at all stoned. It was like, and I realized Lazarus had to take the time to clear that out of me so that he could be as clean and clear as he could be. And it's like, I felt like, well, damn, you know, he shouldn't have to do that. <laughs> I should be responsible to be as out of the way as I can be. And, and therefore, you know, out of respect for Lazarus, I get out of the way. And secondly, out of respect for all those who are listening to him, I get out of the way. And what's channeling? Getting out of the way. And, you know, I mean, if you have somebody coming through, you're great. But if you don't get out of the way, you're not channeling. Yeah, you know, you're not channeling unless you do get out of the way. And uh, we each have our own way. I'm not saying I'll have to do it my way, but that's the way I do it. <laughs> so, I love your answer. You know what your ego is. You know, to some degree, you, you took the time to learn yourself, to learn yeah. your personality, to know that. And prior to allowing massive channeling coming through, you take time to get in touch with all aspects of yourself so that you, Jack, can be out of the way. So when Lazarus comes through, it has the language, the tone, the original, everything. And you do that both for Lazarus, even if there are chemicals 
in your system that would have altered your personality. Lazarus can um, change the subtle energy so that you are fully available and you, Jack, choose to channel and you, Jack, choose to do all of the work to get out of the way in order to serve in this way. How beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, um, I have one of your books here. This was a <laughs> gift from Dr. Bonnie. Yes. Oh, it's so beautiful to me. Such a gorgeous book. And uh, I am so grateful. I know you give very, very few interviews. And I know that you built something online. And I'd love for you to talk about that just a little bit. And then for us to jump into Lazarus, I'd love for anyone that's watching this, because you've built a, um, a location where all of your materials, books, cha um, yeah. uh, channels, um, uh, videos, pay-per-views, anything that you're doing is available. How would you describe that? And then, of course, we'll put it in the um, description of all of the places we put this. But if someone's listening on the podcast, I'd love for you to make sure that they know how to find you as well. Okay, how to find? Well, it's very simple. It's a website, you know, www, whatever, lazaris.com and just all lowercase L-A-Z-A-R-I-S.com. And it's, it's well, yeah, I didn't put it together. People put it together. Allison, who, who is uh, the mastermind and, the, and just this wonderful, incredible uh, person that's handling the Lazarus material and and uh, all that activity. It's far more, more than I can possibly do. <laughs> and and as, as so much in charge of putting this together with her team of people, I call them the, uh, the, the Miracle Management management Team, the MMT, the Miracle Management Team. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, she's has woven this team together and woven this web, <laughs> this website together that has all the material. One of the workshops, or one of the question times uh, I was talking about, yeah, and they're like over 200 recordings and blah, blah, blah. And Allison said, Jack, there's over 700 recordings. Oh, you know, uh, so I, I, I have to catch up on what's going on. But uh, it's at lazarus.com. And, and there is all kinds of information, all kinds of articles to read. Yes, there's pay-per-views and there's recordings to purchase and things, but there's also a lot of very available information at no charge whatsoever. You know, segments of eight, eight minutes to 10 minutes, those are segments from Lazarus that is available uh, just to be listened to. And a lot of articles to read that he's written, that I've written, and uh, that other people. And there's also in connection with that, there's a... Uh, uh, it's not really a forum. It's 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 a, a sacred place where magicians gather for people to get together to uh, you know not email but to write po post messages to each other and discuss things and and uh, you know like get together for the solstice for example and let's all do this meditation and and, and then let's let's get on and go into that sacred place for, where magicians gather to. You know, share. This is my experience. What about you? What about you? Back and forth. And what do you think of this? And what do you think of that? So it's an online, living, breathing community that's also connected with the otherwise, you know, website, which is you know, this this massive base of information. But yeah, to find out about, about more about me, more about Lazarus, particularly Lazarus and all that he's done over these these years. Uh, you know, Lazarus.com, easiest easiest Lazarus. way. Lazarus.com and a shout out to Allison Rose. Thank you for making sure that this happened. She sent me segments of a book that she's writing, um, a, a tiny, a, just it reads like poetry about you, Jack. Um, and so I'm so looking forward to interviewing Allison Rose as well. You both are concept synergy. Concept synergy. Um, yeah. Concept synergy. And so thank you, Allison Rose and Dr. Bonnie and um, Tony Camacho and Ginger and Daniel for introducing me to Jack. And for Jack, thank you for bringing Lazarus to the world. I'm going to grab this book again, right? Um, <laughs> you want to talk about just a, a little bit 
about the, it seems you drop in very, very quickly into Lazarus. And then- Yeah, we'll, we'll a lot be, of years. <laughs> a lot of years. Yeah. Is it okay. okay to talk just a little bit about what's written here while you're dropping in? Or is it better just to sure. stay with you? That's fine. Okay. You can talk about what's written there. And I'll, while you're doing that, I'll head into trance. Okay, and, and come, wonderful. And as you. soon as you want to come back in with, that I want to just um I okay. picked out thank you by the way I really enjoyed talking with you oh okay. same Get here, here. <laughs> thanks Jack this is oh how would you advise us to manifest our best reality Lazarus answers in this book quote there is a range of best realities the most difficult choices you have to make are the choice between good things and good things. The choice between good things and bad things are really easy to make. You may offer yourself a range of best choices, say three or four, and that's when it gets tough. I'm so excited for Lazarus to join us. All right, all right, well, indeed. Sarah, it's a pleasure to join you, a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to have an opportunity to interact, to talk with people, to talk with you, and to share ideas with you, and also with those who happen to be listening in, of course. So, Lazarus. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and for for being who you are. Everything that I have witnessed thus far in my experience of seeing you live in the recordings that Tony Camacho shared and over time with the different friends that have said, have you heard of this? Have you met our friend? And I love how the community refers to you as a friend. And so Lazarus, for those that don't know what a channel is, would you answer that for the community, for all of those that are watching, and especially for those that are listening? Well, all right. Indeed, the channel <laughs> fairly much answered what a channel is, indeed, since he's been doing it all these years. And indeed, what a channel is, is someone who is willing to allow other beings, other consciousness, other expressions of consciousness to become conscious through them. They allow themselves in a way to be a vortex of energy, a vortex for communication, not necessarily of, but for communication, that they are willing in that way, much as in your technology indeed, uh, to create a frequency of vibration to open not to a frequency of vibration, to allow a frequency of vibration to flow through them. They have themselves a resonance that can receive and can release that energy. So it's not that everybody, everybody can channel will. That's quite, there are those who have a particular range of resonance or a range of possible resonance who can hold and release frequencies of vibration. And therefore, in that sense, a channel is someone who is able to do that, has the facility, the ability to open up to and to receive, be a receptacle for, and to release that reception, what it receives, has that capability, and beyond that, has the willingness to let that happen, has a willingness to allow that to be. When we first, for example, when we first communicated, when indeed the channel in an altered state, he thought he was asleep, he thought he was asleep, but in altered state, we first made a communication at that time with Penny, who was there witnessing. The first thing was to ask permission. We asked permission 
we first communicated, even before we talked to Penny, we first communicated with the channel when he was in a meditation, not through him, but to him, where he experienced our consciousness, experienced our being. He had created a rendition. He created a, a environment to experience and a rendition. And we talked with him, not asking permission to channel, just to talk to him, just to experience and let him experience us, to see how that would work, to see how that would fit. And as he opened up to that, as he was willing to do that, indeed, why we connected with him is we knew he had the facility, the ability to channel us, but would it be something he would be willing to do? We first had that connection just one-to-one -one. months before we then came through and actually communicated with Penny. And at that time, the permission, we asked that permission, do we have permission? And her question was, knowing what happened to Edgar Casey, for example, perhaps one of the most well-known channels in, in that regard, she asked, how, would it be not, you do not have permission if it's going to be in any way harmful? And so we suggested, all right, it will not be harmful. We can assure you of that. It will only get better and better. And we would suggest with that permission, the channel granted, she granted, and we began the communication. So it's an ability that a person has to hold a resonance and release it. And it is a willingness to, as the channel put it so clearly, to get out of the way so that that energy, that resonance, our resonance in this case, but whomever is channeling resonance can come through without interference, without static, without noise. And that's what channeling is about. That's what channeling is about. Thank you for that. Lazarus, how do you answer the question, what is an angel? And also, what is a saint? Ah, all right. <laughs> Indeed, as the channel put it, they are sparks of or lights of the divine. And what's here is to understand in this saints here is how to say, we try to make it as, as direct as possible. Here is this energy that is God, goddess, all that is. This energy that has been a rendition of which has been called God, a rendition of which has been called goddess in some religions and this sort of way. There is this energy that is the divinity of consciousness. Whatever name it is given, we give the name God, goddess, all that is. And that is this energy that is all that is. God, goddess, all that is. And everything, everyone, every energy is a part of that whole. You're a part of that whole. Everybody is a part of that whole. There is one consciousness. It's not like there's a million consciousnesses out there. Consciousness is singular. There's not consciousness as, 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 as. It's consciousness. <laughs> and that's just one. But in that sense, you as a being within that, a part of that whole, you want to discover who you are. You want to discover what you're about. This piece of this God, God is all that is, this wholeness. I want to separate and discover myself. And we would suggest here the first round of separation, if you will, are angels, those light beings that first said, who am I? But more importantly, even said, why? Why am I? And in that, the first explosion, if you will, of consciousness, angels, these sparks of light, these beings of light, certainly so, that in that sensing as are there, learning and discovering who they are. And in that sense, out of that first explosion, another explosion, of, and another, and another, and another. Thought of this grand pyrotechnic 
Fourth of July celebration of this <laughs> consciousness that angels and 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 souls and higher selves and conscious beings, if you will, and from that, in that sense, exploding further, exploding further, units of consciousness, units of consciousness, units of UCs of consciousness, <laughs> that in that sensing, discovering who they are, units of consciousness, becoming subatomic particles, becoming atomic particles, becoming particles, molecules, whoa, what a divine presence that must be. But no, there's more. There's the mineral kingdom, and then there's the animal kingdom, and then there's the, the or rather the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, the animal kingdom, the human animal, the human animal, ah, oh, who then stood up and reached for the sky, <laughs> reached for <laughs> becoming human beings. Human animals and human beings are different. Ah, this must be the epitome. No, there is the spiritual being, this human spiritual being, and a higher self and a soul, and angels and divine beings, all in this massive, complexity, this massive labyrinth of consciousness, each with the same goal, to know who I am, because the I is ultimately all that is. God, God is all that is. I want to know my divinity. I want to know my wholeness, my oneness, my singularity that is all and to do that i need to forget it and remember it i need to ask why and in the asking separate myself from the one to get outside of the one to get outside of the set of one so that i can understand it and rejoin it and become it the one who is searching for itself to become one, and you are part of that, as is everyone. Angels, divine conscious units, divine beings, souls, higher selves, all coming into your higher self, your soul, your higher self, coming into a human form, others into other forms, but all seeking to return. But angels are among the first of that explosion of why, the sparks of the divine that are seeking themselves, who then explode, as you will, ultimately reaching that state of consciousness units to come back again, often to the human form to become who they once were, one, all that is, God, God is, all that is. Saints, Chandler said it well, those who love themselves, but love something and someone more than themselves, who live that, who reach that, who care more, care enough about themselves and care more about another and do something with that, change the world because of that. That's what a saint is. I love your definition, Lazarus. And so the first man that climbed Mount Everest and when it said it couldn't be done, or Roger Bannister running the four minute mile, when others said humanly, scientists, everyone said it's not possible. They loved themselves, did the impossible and therefore are saints in human society. That is phenomenal. Lazarus, there's so much I want to ask. And um, uh, 
so many people are afraid. Religions have said, hey, anyone that channels or angels or lower heavens, upper heavens, there's a lot of fear in many of the religions right now. And I have always kind of been in place as a way to get humanity to unite against something. How do you see people that are afraid of those that channel or those that are saying, oh, I communicate with angels and saints or the beloved that have transitioned are coming through? How does Lazarus address those fears and answer that question to, you know, the tops of different religious heads say, if you're practicing yoga, for example, or if you're channeling, you are going to a lower consciousness and you're exposing yourself to some kind of offense. Well, a couple of things here are important to, to understand. Religion and religious experience are two different things. The word religion is a realignment, is what the origin of that word is. That, that uh, It's a realignment with your source, with your, your internal being. A person who is out of alignment with themselves, who is out of center, who is lost in the world, they need to realign with themselves. And that is a realignment process. And it can happen a number of ways. Drug abuse can go through rehab and uh, you know, physical illness can go through various uh, healing processes, etc., to realign themselves through medication or through yoga or through physical therapy or any number of ways. When one is out of touch spiritually, you need to realign with what you consider divine, however you term it. We call it God, God is all that is. One word, God, God is all that is. You need to realign. You need to have a realignment with your spirituality. Another way to say it, Sarah, is that you need to remember who you are. You need to remember, remember re member to here's the membering you've fallen apart now you need to remember yourself you need to remember who you are and to have a realignment which is in another way of saying a religious experience and that's what religion is supposed to be it's supposed to be a way to help people have their realignment, to have their spiritual realignment to get together. Unfortunately, religions have become institutionalized where their goal is not so much to help people realign themselves as it is to keep building their membership so that they can build a new church, so they can build a bigger palace, so that they can have you know, more influence, so they can lobby the Congress more fully, whatever, in this regard. It's become an institution. And in that sense, it sees other religions as competition. The Catholics who, in Ireland, the IRA and the whole Irish conflict between Protestants and Catholics in Ireland, people killing each other, Families destroyed the tragedy of all that, of religion, religious people in that same thing, trying not to realign, with, but to gain membership, whatever, et cetera. The point is in that same thing, at the tops of these in that sense, the competition, they see other religions as competition, as something to be. You got to be wary of those Lutherans. You got to be concerned about those Episcopalians. You got to watch out for those... Uh, Southern Baptists and that sort of thing. You got to watch out for those evangelical people on, on, the, on the network, televisions, etc. that's just selling goods and all this sort of thing. The Jimmy Bakers of the world, and etc. There's all that sort of, of going on in terms of, of to organize and keep the institution that is their religion, not the religious experience. 
but that's at the boundary, that's at the edge, that's at the extreme of that energy. But if you look inside of that, if you look beyond the loud voices at the people, at the Southern Baptists in this town, at the Episcopalian there, as the Catholic mother, as the Buddhist family member, as the Hindu, this sort of thing, as the people people. They have a different lot. They're the ones still looking for and finding a realignment with their spirituality through their yoga, through their Hinduism, their Buddhism, through their uh, Muslim religion, through their Christian faith, through their Catholic faith or Protestant faith, or through their lack of naming any religion as their faith, finding that sense of religious experience is still there. And among those people, if you find your spiritual connection, your relationship with God, or goddess or with nature through yoga or through a religious practice of meditation or through talking with angels or through listening to a channel and seeing if that information has makes any sense to you has relevance to you if that information gives you a connection gives you a realignment with yourself a realignment with your spirituality, a realignment with your higher self or soul, or by whatever name. That's cool. That's fine. These guys, and I, we say guys because usually that's what it is, a rather group of chauvinistic old folks and this same thing. These guys don't like it, not because they think it's, but because it threatens their power. It threatens their control. It threatens their institution that they're trying to protect at all costs. Whereas the people who are within those institutions, not concerned about maintaining them, but using them to find a realignment, whatever works for you is cool with me, even if it doesn't work for me. I don't want to talk to angels. I want to do this or that, but hey, if that works for you, cool. Most people, most people are in that place. Now, we say that, Sarah, and we also need to acknowledge now in a world with such polarization, such polarization, where people are losing their sense of identity, people are losing their alignment on both sides of the polarized. It's not that, yeah, those people on the right are losing their, those people on the, they're both are losing their identification. They're losing their identity. They're losing their alignment. And in that then, such things as talking to angels and talking to channels and, and listening to channeled information sounds really scary. And therefore, they are many of them, not all, many of them are retreating into the institution, not even the religious experience, but the institution of their religion, which is not necessarily a named religion, but their religion of politics, their religion of belief that my religion of the second amendment for example my religion of what freedom of the press means my religion of what you see it doesn't necessarily mean a named religion they're retreating into their institutions that are unfortunate religions and therefore losing their touch with that spirituality losing their avenues for realignment and that's sad and that's why it is perhaps important, indeed it is important, for people such as yourselves and others to open that way for yourselves, to live that yourselves, so that others can see as they find themselves lost in that regard, that, hey, maybe so-and-so who seems to be together or to have somehow something together, Maybe they're worth listening to. Maybe 
I'll explore what they are doing. It may or may not work for them, but it may just open the door. In other words, as you work with angels and, and, and work with channeling and work with these energies, someone seeing, wow, you know, that, that woman, you know, gosh, look at the life she's had coming out of Pakistan, coming out of this, all that could be wrong with her life and all that, and look at how she's so, this light, this wonder, what's she doing? Oh, she's doing that. Maybe I'll explore that. I'll open up where I will find my, start finding my realignment. I tried that angel stuff. That didn't work for me. But you know, I found this fascinating book about how I could love myself more fully. I found this wonderful information about how to live a life more, more rewarding in this sort of way. And that is what worked for me. So even though doing what you do didn't work for me, willing to explore what you do opened the door and I did find something that will work for me. So that's what, what is Jack, there, and how we would respond to it. Lazarus, Jack, all of this is so beautiful. Let's just add something there in terms of the institutions of religion are more interested in maintaining that institution. Okay, people who are part of this religion or that religion, et cetera. Yes, the more they fear, the more they're drawn into that sterile, static place of the institution. But it is, and it can be, once they're there, they can make, wait a minute, this isn't working for me. I can use this as a foundation from which to leap. And I can use the tenets of the religion, not the institution, but the tenets of the religion to step outside the institution back into the experience. For example, there are a number of Christian in this country, in the country, United States, Christian organizations who realize, look, that the church as it has been defined is too rigid, is too static, is too corrupt, whatever. But the tenets of love each other and care about each other and the golden rule and things like this, we're going to step outside the institution into our own group of communication, into our own community. In other words, the institution becomes so rigid, but if people step out of that into community, into their sense of interaction, What's this religion about? Not the people, not the rules, but what's the philosophy? Let's focus on the philosophy. Then that institution can be, as you say, a foundation from which to leap with the philosophy, with the psychology or the sociology of the religion rather than the staticness of the institution. That's the separation between a religion and religious organization, maybe is a better way to say it, religion and religious organization. That's where community can be found and built and growth can occur. Yeah. So beautiful. I, we are coming to the end of our time together and there is so much I want to ask you. <laughs> and I have, uh, um, I know this is, more on the website that is concept synergy lazarus.com can answers to the questions like the akashic records engaging with um uh, uh, relationships to draw in relationships to be able to get out of physical pain i'm a me medical doctor that didn't know that others didn't have their receptors on until I got to medical school. What that means is I've seen angels my whole life, saints and but auras. And it wasn't until medical school at the best medical school in India that I realized, oh, not everyone sees. When we were learning about um, red and green, some people do not have the ability, they're colorblind to certain colors is, when I began, oh, exploring my own extra receptors that were available. Um, are there answers to those types of questions at lazarus.com and videos that we can all dive into? In, in the short answer, yes. <laughs> yes, there are. 
in other words, there's all kinds of, of topics around you know, how to develop relationships, how to de develop your health, physical, emotional, mental health, how to create the, the kind of success, not just the tangible success, but the kinds of success that you want to create. There's the whole range of activity, certainly. So of, of uh, basically the concept is concept synergy, coming together to work together as one to create this, the joy of living life, to create the success, to consciously create success and to learn how to have fun and how to live the fullness of life. <laughs> and there's a full range of yet, how do I do this? How do I do this? I've got this problem sleeping. I've got this problem with this health. I've got my problems, these emotional distresses that are, are, are screwing me up, etc. How do I get past my shame? How do I deal with past life experiences that keep haunting me or coming up? How do I work with discovering and finding my heritage out of you know, out of Atlantis and out of Lemuria prior to it, and perhaps out of Sirius prior to that and that same thing. How do I find my spiritual tradition, my grandmothers, my grandfathers, as we call them, indeed, of your spiritual tradition? All kinds of ways of working and indeed to discover that. Uh, absolutely so. There's a breadth and depth of information that you, you can discover, certainly so. And the online community, in which you can talk about it with other people. Hey, tell me, <laughs> what recording are you listening to? I've got this issue. I don't know how to handle it. Where do I look? I haven't done it. And others are so willing to reach out and help. Hey, I worked with this recording and this is what worked for me. And think about this and work with that. So there's a wonderful the things, sense of community that, that can unfold, not just you know, a recording here, a video there, but people that you can talk with that you can interact with, that you can build that sense of community with beautifully, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you. You see, we've been talking for all these years, as we say, we're not a guru, we're not a master. There are those who have claimed in the past, particularly during the new age of the of the 80s and 90s, etc., that they're the master, they're the guru, you have to go, they're the only one who can no, no, no. We're not a master, we're not a guru, we're a friend. You are on a spiritual journey. You are on that journey. And we would like to come along with you. We would like to walk along with you for a while. And along the way, point, look at that. You might be interested in that. Oh, look at that. You might let oh, What you got going on? Maybe we can help you figure out how to handle that better. What's, what's troubling you? What's, what's bothering you? Let's talk. Let's talk, you and us. Let's be together. Hey, we've got this idea of what you can do and we'll move along and look how you're changing and look how you're growing. And hey, we want to keep walking with you. We want to keep accompanying you as a friend along this journey. And we'll walk with you for a while, 20, 30, 40 years. And by that time, you can walk alone and you can find others who will come along and walk with you that you can walk with that you can say, hey, let me be your friend. Let me walk with you. And hey, let me point this out. Let me point that out. And what's troubling you? And maybe I can help because I've got this wealth of experience that I've, that has become who I am. It's not that I'm gonna teach you this. I'm going to explore this with you as one friend to another. And I'll walk with you for a while, for a number of years. And then you'll be on your own and you'll be finding someone to walk with. So it's like, we'll walk with you for this period of time. Now you're ready to find someone, find those with whom you can walk as a friend to guide and to be there for them as they move along and on and on it goes. And on and on it goes. Lazarus, thank, thank you so much. You have been watching. Very welcome. Thank you. It has been a joy talking with you. It you are the light, <laughs> and I love the sparkle of your energy, and the light in your eyes is so dynamic and so engrossing. And thank you for all thank that you do. And you, you're so you do. you're thank so you. welcome. Such a, a gift. You have been watching Miracle Makers TV. This is episode one of Angels, Saints, and Channels. Oh my gosh, we just experienced Lazarus 
and Jack Purcell. We're so grateful for them being here. And it's so beautiful. They are making the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest time possible through spontaneous cooperation without ecological offense or disadvantage of anyone. I know um, Buck Minister Fuller, who is in the energy realm and the spiritual realm, hearing this is so proud of you of this experience and of all that we've created. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Lazarus. Uh, such a treasure. Until next time, we'll meet again. Looking forward to it. Bye for now. Bye now.